All right. You guys saw our little video um, at the beginning. But welcome to a Sustainable Coffee Buyer's Guide, our lecture today. Um, my name is Julie Hausch, and I'm the Knowledge Development Manager for the Specialty Coffee Association, and I'll be your staff host for today. Um, although you really won't see too much of me because we have these awesome um, presenters that that you will send a huge thank you to our title sponsor, Pacific Barista Series, for bringing you all of these Expo Weekend lectures. Um, hopefully, you've had a chance to join a couple of us today, and we have a few more lined up for you um, after this one, uh, Friday and Saturday as well, too. Uh, we also want to thank Saver Brands, Chemex, and Rostar for their support. Um, so today, basically, as the uh, lecture unfolds, if you have any questions, um, um, we actually have a Q&A section or a Q&A tab you'll see to the right there that we would love for you to ask us questions and um, we will get to those towards the end of the lecture today. Um, before I fully hand this over to our presenters today, due to the nature of the lecture topic, I'd like to read to you the antitrust policy for SA online webinars. Um, it also should be on your screen right now. Um, the Specialty Coffee Association is committed to full compliance with the letter and spirit of European Union United States, state, and other applicable antitrust and trade regulation laws. It is expected that all members, member company representatives, staff, and participants involved in SCA activities shall at all times avoid words and actions that may restrict or appear to restrict competition in our industry, including agreeing to set minimum, maximum, or fixed prices, competitors or potential competitors agreeing to allocate or divide markets, customers, territories, suppliers, or specific bids, and agreeing not to deal with any other party boycotts. When discussions extend into an area of antitrust sensitivity, staff members in attendance shall request the discussion be immediately stopped, and if it does not, shall terminate the meeting. Any questions about this policy or a perceived violation can be directed to the email address executivedirector at sca.coffee or via any of the contact methods on the sca.coffee webpage. It's now my pleasure to introduce Vera Espindola Rafael, who will be moderating today's lecture, A Sustainable Coffee Buyer's Guide. Take it away, Vera. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very happy that you're joining us. Um, today, we're going to talk about the, the Sustainable Coffee Buyer's Guide. And we have today with us Tyler from Azahar, Jeff from Tidientia, and Ryan from Madcap. And uh, we're going to give a good bit of a background of the guide itself, as well as to tackle a bit also the methodology and income targets, first impressions, and um, uh, show us a survey that we have done in order to go from all the way from the grower's perspective to the consumer perspective. And then at the end of this lecture, we'll be having the last 10 to 5 minutes for questions and answers. But before that, we actually want uh, to know a bit who is actually listening. So we, we created a poll and it's going to pop up on your screen. You will be able to just answer it by clicking on the area of work or role that best describes your work in coffee. Um, so I'm going to start polling right now. And um, just fill out what you, where you feel most comfortable in. And in the meantime, we agreed that Jeff would do a dance in order not to waste time. <laughs> People are clicking in already. Numbers are coming in. Basically monitoring here a bit the time that we don't spend too much time on this. And then what I will do, I will, in the next 20 seconds, I will start closing the poll. And then I'll read to you a bit the answers what we have. <clears throat> yep, I will start closing down the poll. Thank you, Jeff, for that entertainment. And the, the, the poll is closed. And then what we saw is that the majority of the listeners are basically roasters by 18%, followed by the green coffee buyer, 70%. Other 70% baristas by 60%, followed by importers and producers, actually 7%. Um, and then we have others around 4 to 5% research, NGOs, uh, coppers as well, and um, importers. So that's a, a bit of an overview who's actually listening on this call. 
Um, so basically, um, the con concept of, the, of this idea of the Sustainable Coffee Buyer's Guide uh, started a couple of years ago, and it's specifically in a period where we had low coffee prices. And although the low coffee prices have gone up in 2020, especially from February onwards, um, the causes behind the crisis has not really been solved. Some might even said that during this pandemic, we can actually see more the risk that producers face as well that we are noticing the vulnerable positions they are in. Um, so the conversation needs to continue. And I would like to invite Tyler to start telling a bit more about the intention of the guide and the work behind it. Yes, thank you, Vera. Um, um, we uh, started in, in actually 2018 working on um, a guide to connect um, powerful uh, FOB prices to meaningful farm gate prices um, and to actually try to go about defining the prices that um, we paid with a little bit more context. And one of the troubling questions we always had was, you know, we may be paying in the specialty industry, um, and I'm speaking a little bit for Osmar, the company I started as an exporter, but also as a local roaster and retailer in Colombia. We may be paying prices that are, you know, exponentially higher than the market prices from a percentage basis. But at the end of the day, what does it matter how much higher it is if at the end of the day it's not achieving, you know, the goals that we're actually interested in achieving? And so we began to, to ask ourselves if we couldn't look at income. Um, and different income goals as a metric to be able to arrive at price. Um, and so a little bit of, 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 of what this guide is, I think, is kind of the result of 10 years of, of um, trading coffee from Colombia, of trying to get as far away from the C market and the C price as possible, um, but to, to then really sort of um, trade a more systematic way of going about um, arriving at price. Thanks, Vera. I can talk about the methodology too, if you want now. Vera, I think you're on mute. Yes. Um, so a little bit, yeah, a little bit more about the methodology and about the findings about from the guide. Okay. Yeah. So um, as you can see um, on the next slide, what we what we wanted to try to do at the at the base of the guide was to create a formula um, that was in a certain sense pre-competitive that anyone could use um, if they have uh, research, um, up to date re research specifically around. Um, volumes or yields and costs of production. And so the, the sort of theory behind this was, <clears throat> can we not arrive at price? Like, can we not arrive at price by setting specific income goals? Income goals represent the I in the equation. If we have um, known cost of production and known volumes, the cost of the production being C and uh, volumes being V. So if we can go out and we can do the research um, on an up-to-date seasonal basis to know what average yields are in a specific region and what it costs on average to produce the unit that certain producers are selling and the product that they're selling. In Colombia, the, <clears throat> the product that most farmers sell is parchment coffee. Um, then perhaps we could arrive at price based on a specific income goal. And um, when looking at those income goals, we set out to workshop three. Um, the first one was uh, poverty line. We don't see poverty line as truly a goal. We see it more as an awakening call. But we do want to know, we did want to know what, what is the basic price. And you'll see this in a little bit that would need to be paid on average to a farmer just for poverty line to be met. Um, when defining poverty line, we used um, the National Statistics Department of Columbia's estimate. Um, for 2018, this guide was compiled in 2019 based on numbers in 2018. Um, and the average uh, income per day was 5,800 pesos at the time, which at the time of the guide's writing worked out to be about $1.70 per day. 
now because of um, what's going on with exchange rates, it's a little bit less. Then we looked at um, a minimum wage as another um, benchmark. There's a really strong minimum wage culture in Colombia in certain sectors, um, and unfortunately not in others. And so since this is a, you know, a real legal benchmark that's updated annually by the government, we thought that, well, that could be interesting to see what kind of price would a farmer need to sell their coffee for in this region and this region and in that one too, to on average be able just to make a minimum wage. Um, and in addition to the, the minimum wage, we looked at um, a, an extra bit of income for the farmer to be able to pay um, into their own health care and pension, um, almost like an independent uh, contractor would have to pay. Um, in this case, we're, we're talking about an independent farmer. Um, and minimum wage uh, for last year was 828,000 pesos, which worked out at the guide's writing to about $250 per month. Um, finally, we looked at something that we called a more sustainable wage. Um, and a more sustainable wage is, is simply the, the, the minimum wage um, and the allowance for paying health care and pension times three. Um, and we did this because on average we found across the four regions that we did the study in that um, three adults, including uh, the farm owner, tend to depend principally off of the income from one farm. And um, we figured that if, if there were a case where there was kind of a lone, a lone bachelor just, just working on his or her own, um, you know, you know, they would have some extra money in that case for repayment of debts, infrastructure improvements, et cetera. Again, these are, um, I, when talking about this, I always try to put emphasis on not losing the forest for the trees. The real core of this guide is the formula. Um, and these are, these are income goals that we've been workshopping um, and starting to use in our own conversations in the trade about price. Um, and then the, the last thing I'd like to say um, really quickly, uh, Vera, before I turn it back over to you, um, is that we, um, we, we, in addition to the income goals, one of the things that always kind of perplexed us about Colombia is, is noticing that there's quite a difference from one region to another. And, and Colombia, while it is, you know, one of the largest exporting countries in, in coffee, it is um, it's just one among many. And within Colombia itself, there are many different regions, many different sizes of farms. And so part of the spirit of this guide also was to acknowledge the diversity that there is in different productive models in within mm -hmm. coffee. Um, mm -hmm. On one hand, you have someone producing coffee completely by hand on a steep, steep mountain slope in southern Colombia. And then in the central part of the, Columbia, uh, of the country, you may have someone who owns more than 20 hectares and is now experimenting with using semi-mechanized picking um, to, to collect their coffee. And so I think that, um, you know, that, that was another important part of it. Okay. Thank you, Tyler. Of so um, the, on the slide, what we were seeing, we're seeing here the specifically the regions that have been um, the, where the producers were interviewed and where the workshops were held. Tell us a bit more about this and about the, the results that you found. Yeah, so we we wanted to try to focus on um, on hot spots for specialty in Colombia. We are by no means under the uh, uh, um, illusion that this um, the prices in this guide are representative of cost of production and average yields of all farmers. We were really micro, almost nano, focusing on in on specific regions um, where we've been working with uh, talented specialty coffee producers for a while. And those regions um, were principally in the center and south southwest of the country. And so you can see, um, for those of you that are familiar with with special with uh, different growing regions in Colombia, we worked in Kin a little bit in Quindío, which is that tiny sort of red region um, up towards the top of the map. And that is uh, that's also happens to be where we're based and where we started the company ten years ago. Then we worked in um, the southernmost part of Tolima, which has become very well known for growing high quality, not only high quality coffee but also high quality organic certified coffee. We specifically worked with a group of organic certified producers when doing the the workshops there. And then we looked at southern Lula, and we also looked finally at southwestern Nariño. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit some of the, uh, the initial results um, that we have. 
And so we, we've, we've been shopping, in other words, sharing with, um, with some different roasters out there, a pilot version of the guide um, where we compile the results of these initial uh, workshops that we did to arrive at cost of production, um, average yields, and therefore prices to achieve the different income goals that we're, that we're looking at um, with producers. And the first region we looked at was Wheela. And in Wheela, there were 20 producers who participated in the study. Um, and after dealing with outliers, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later, someone that either had extremely low yields or extremely high yields or extremely low cost of production or extremely high cost of production, um, we ended up using the results from 14 uh, uh, different farmers, even though we look carefully at the results from the other 20. Um, the average size of the farms here were five hectares. Um, average productivity was around almost 24 uh, 60 kilogram bags. We tend to measure international productivity in 60 kilogram bags. And then um, you could look at the, the average cost of production um, was around $1.32 when, when converted mm -hmm. to, to a pound of green coffee. Um, one important thing um, that, that I'd like to stress is we wanted to make this as relevant as possible um, to, to farmers and to people that are really negotiating at the farm gate level. Mm -hmm. And we wanted it to also require more transparency in the chain. And so what we did in the actual um, pilot version of the guide was just to show the prices that producers would be familiar with negotiating. And so if you see that kind of quadrant on the left, um, under poverty line, minimum wage, and, and a, a more sustainable income, those are prices in Colombian pesos. The COP stands for Colombian peso, um, and they're per carga. A carga is 125 kilograms of parchment coffee, um, it's what a mule used to be able to car carry on its back approximately. And so that's still the main unit of trade and that's the unit we use um, when talking about um, the different farm gate prices. Later we'll make an attempt to sort of translate them, them through and I think you'll find that interesting, but I'm gonna compare now one other region uh, with Southern Rila. So here you can see um, next to Southern Rila, Southwestern Nariño. Um, similar amount of farmers, there were slightly less outliers. So of the 23 um, that we did the study with there, there were 19 whose who's, uh, data was finally included in these calculations. The average size of the farm, unlike in Southern Wheela, where it was five uh, hectares on average among the group we worked with, here is just a little over three. Um, you can also notice that the average productivity, instead of being almost 24, 60 kilograms per hectare, is really just about 15, which is kind of in line actually with Colombia's um, national average. And then um, finally, the cost of production is a little bit higher as well. What does the combination of those three variables mean? It ultimately means, as you can see off to the left, that in the same region in Nariño to achieve the same goals, um, the same income goals, whether it's, you know, the kind of shock value, poverty line income goal that we set just for illustrative purposes, or whether you're setting out, uh, setting out to try to be able to pay a price that generates one minimum wage or a more sustainable income, in other words, three minimum wages for a farm, you can see that the prices are significantly higher. And that's really due to the, um, the smaller farm sizes, the lower productivity, um, and the higher cost of production. And then um, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, you can see, I just wanted to show a little bit briefly when we look at another region. This is a region um, where the farmers that we work with are producing um, organic certified coffee. So you can see the productivity is even lower, the farm size is lower. Um, and while some the costs are also lower, it's just a little over $1 per pound of green coffee. Um, you can see that the, the, the prices needed to achieve a more sustainable income really ramp up quickly, even if the prices to achieve mm -hmm. poverty or minimum wage may have been lower than, say, southwestern Nariño. Um, and then finally, we look at uh, what we call the Cordillera municipalities. Those are just the, the higher altitude municipalities in Quindío. Um, where we've been buying coffee pretty seriously for the last five years. Um, and you can see there it's, uh, it's even, it's, it's not organic uh, uh, certified coffee and the productivity is even lower than it is um, in Tolima, but the farm size is a little bit larger. Um, so some of the numbers, uh, you know, clock in similarly and in some cases a bit lower and in some cases a little bit higher as the different variables move. Um, 
so you know the, the the last thing before I turn it back to Vera um, that I wanted to to spend a little bit of time on is um, we tried to create a chart also in looking at this to re realize quite a range of possibility. Um, while those numbers that we looked at on the previous slides represent an exact point in the middle um, or an exact average, what we wanted to look at here is kind of a range. Um, and so on the x-axis at the bottom of the, this graph, you have price increasing, and on the y-axis, you have um, productivity measured in total cargos, total 125 kilogram units of parchment. Um, and as you can see here, there's there's sort of a quadrant, um, and that the star in the middle really represents um, the intersection of uh, sorry, and the bottom the x-axis we're looking at cost, not price. Um, intersection of the cost of production per cargo and the total cargos produced per year. Um, and there you can see in in Wheela how we got those numbers by arriving at the intersection of the cost and the total yield. Um, and then you can see, you know, some of the, the outliers, um, the further up sort of into the quadrant that you get, um, the lower price, uh, the lower the prices that's required to achieve the same income goal. And vice versa, if you go down sort of towards the, the bottom right section, as cost of production goes up and volume goes down, the price that's actually needed to be, pay to be paid, I don't know if you can see it, but that little dot D, um, would, would need to be a, uh, quite a bit higher. And we'll look at that in a second. And I just wanted to show you, we did that for each region. So we layered on Southwestern Nariño, so you can kind of see the range of possibilities in the producers that we interviewed. Um, we looked at it for Planadas, we looked at it for Quindío, and then finally we looked a little bit about what the official averages are for all farms in Colombia based on a cost of production study that was released for the first time in 2018. Um, and then finally, you can kind of see the outlier key, which shows you, okay, if you're in that little A section of the of the square, the, or the B corner, the C corner, the D corner, what price would need to be uh, paid to achieve each one of the you know the the income goals? Um, and and essentially, what we could see is, you know, uh, productivity and and cost, as as one would imagine, really are levers. And the more productive a farm is, or the lower the cost is. Um, the lower price um, can actually be uh, afforded to be paid and still achieve the same income goal. Now, we, I, we just dropped in a couple of pictures here to kind of illustrate the difference. As I mentioned earlier, in, in southern Colombia, that's a picture of a, of a farm in, in Pitalito in a small rural neighborhood called Charhuayaco. You can see it's, that's actually a collection of farms. Um, each one there is, is, is basically less than uh, far, is responsible for farming less than four hectares of land, whereas you can see a farm that's almost um, 40, 50 hectares up in Santander above it. And so a lot of this is about kind of trying to, to, to find a systematic way to go about addressing the diversity in coffee um, while still achieving income goals that, um, you know, that make sense. Thank you for that, Tyler, for that. Um the explanation in itself. I want to start uh, talking also to, also to to Ryan, to Jeff here. Um, Ryan, I want to go back to you and, and, and ask you, so what has been the, the interest of your company in this particular topic, in this guide, and what has been uh, your first impression on it? Uh, thanks, Vera. Yeah, so we're a um, small to medium um, specialty uh, roaster in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and um, our company has always been based around uh, building relationships with uh, coffee producers and seeking out really high quality coffee. And really, um, I was with Tyler when uh, he first started putting together some of these preliminary results um, almost a couple years back. And um, this has always been something really um, that we've been seeking out, um, something that gives gives a little bit more direction to um, Um, what is uh, use of coffee sustainably? Um, and from uh, a lot of conversations in the past, you know, this is something we we seek out. And a lot of times, these benchmarks end up getting created. Things that are either irrelevant to um, a certain area or certain producers, or they're built off of ideas like, well. This is better than what their neighbors are getting paid for coffee, um, or 
this maybe is a little bit more money than um, you'd pay for a coffee of a different cupping store. Um, but rarely, um, I think, had we seen something that um, really broke down some of the distinct issues and also just seeing like, where does poverty start when you start looking at um, price per carga? And um, some of the results in certain areas uh, were pretty enlightening, um, um, some that we worked in. And then, uh, beyond that, uh, really fascinated by how much distinction um, you could see um, in the different areas too, um, from looking um, in a small section of Columbia, um, not just seeing, okay, we know that Colombian coffee might cost different um, than coffee from Peru mm -hmm. or coffee from Kenya, but um, just within an area, um, seeing how much uh, price differences there are and what it takes to um, sustainably produce coffee. And also just getting a more in-depth look and survey sampling of what cost of production um, actually is. Um, because I think sometimes uh, those questions can really um, start to, um, you start looking at what it costs to produce something and there's can be this uh, kind of long rabbit trail and you kind of just find yourself walking in circles for a while. So mm -hmm. um, seeing it outlined in such a systematic way, um, I think starts speaking towards um, kind of uh, certain benchmarks and metrics that mm -hmm. uh, are quite helpful, um, not just for a company like Madcap, but I think there's a lot of uh, just really well-intentioned coffee buyers, um, you know, all across the world and coffee companies that are really looking for um, what does it take to make this sustainable? And I think in the face of uh, a crisis that we're in, um, also trying to ask that question, um, what can we pay to um, truly love and enjoy? Um, we'll be here, you know, in a couple decades also. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for that, Ryan. Um, over to you, Jeff, before you wander off again. Um, so what, so for you as well as uh, for your company, um, what has been um, your particular interest related to the vision of the company as well as um, the first impressions uh, and comments towards the guide? Yeah, thank you, Vera. Uh, and my daughter, Luching Zuki, next door and it was sucking away the bandwidth, so I had to, <laughs> I had to ask her to pause. Um, yeah, you know, this guide was something that uh, struck me as as incredibly useful and helpful. Uh, all of us, I think, to different degrees, uh, as we go about as buyers trying to evaluate um, circumstances at the farms we're working with, and we think about this whole question about what is a good price for coffee, mm -hmm. uh, which is a different question than what is the right price. And you know, if you look around the specialty industry, I think there's plenty of aspiration and, and no shortage of good intention, but sometimes the good intentions are short-circuited by uh, false assumptions about what a, a price means or how it fits into a context. And that's largely because we, we lack context as an industry. Uh, the references that we have to work with if we're trying to determine uh, what a good price is tend to be things like global averages or commodity prices or certific uh, certification standards, which tend to be highly generalized and aren't, as we know, that sensitive to context. Mm -hmm. And if you look around and just say, well, I'm, I'm paying more than uh, my neighbor and she's paying more than the person over there, and the, the producer's happy with the price because it's more than they get elsewhere and it's more than their neighbor receives, you know, we have all this, this constant um, reference that builds upon other references, none of which are grounded really in um, the context that asks the different question, which is, uh, how does this uh, sit? How does this price work in the context of uh, living income goals? You know, and uh, a good colleague of mine sometimes asks this question, what if a better price is 
still not a good price. You know, I think we we all know that better does not equal right. And uh, when you start asking the, the questions about what is the right price, you know, you, you revert to these traditional economist answers, which say, well, what uh, what will the market pay? But that's not the answer that any of us are seeking. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to find what is the price that helps us all as an industry achieve mm-hmm. our collective goals? What are the prices that help motivate uh, producers to invest more in their work? What are the prices that motivate people to stay on farms and not leave them for other opportunities? Uh, what are the right prices that allow for a farmer to not just um, pay their family well, but pay the people who they need uh, to come help them with the work on the farm well, you know, and that's one I know one of the big questions that has been facing the industry lately is around the invisible parts of production and the farm workers who are not at all reflected in in FOB prices. But if we start with the premise that, you know, farmers have to be making enough money to be thriving, not just surviving, uh, and that's the only way uh, they'll be in a position to pay greater prices to those around them. Uh, make the whole supply chain work, we need to have these kinds of tools to begin to reframe uh, the discussions about income uh, using information that is tied to context and that is generated um, in a space that considers also uh, what is their farmer, if they choose to consider, uh, or continue farming, what are they giving up? What um, what how does their income from the farming compare to other things that they might be doing uh, so to me this uh this guide is a breath of fresh air and that it's you know while obviously still very preliminary and based on a, a small amount of data uh, it's beginning to move us one step closer to having the right conversations and making good choices based on asking the right questions uh, mm-hmm. which i think at the end of the day if if um as a specialty company, and we're all in the specialty business, we're in theory at least not selling a commodity. Mm-hmm. So we're selling something that's more like an experience. And I know from the way people consume coffee and think about specialty, uh, that part of that experience and, and the value proposition is based on the idea that nobody's getting ripped off. So I think it follows that there's an obligation we all share to perform more due diligence on that part. Thank you for that, Jeff. I think in, the, in that sense, I mean, at the end of of, of this whole conversation, it it needs ha- to not only head towards um, what's correct price, also for 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 producers, but also understand more about so what are the implications for the rest of the chain when we're having this conversation. Before we go into that, and I just want to um, make uh, some time to answer a couple of questions that are being posed here by the audience regarding. Um, the specifically the methodology, Tyler. So I'll go, I'm gonna direct these questions to you before we head into the survey as such. So here, Tyler, there is a question regarding um, from Bruna Hatoa, uh, who asked about the income goals. Did you see any difference between producers who work with roasters for coffee shops directly, um, small big family producers to producers who work for big industries? Um, in terms of, in terms of how, um just in terms of what kind of prices need to be paid for the for larger yeah. farmers, smaller farmers. Yes, yes, I think tied to those income goals exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we found that um, there were certain farmers that um, could make great income selling their coffee for a more competitive price. Um, you know, either they had more mechanized operations or simply more land. Um, and then certain farmers that really needed a price if they're going to be able to continue producing coffee under the model that they were producing it under. Um, and I think, you know, I think of it a lot of the times kind of like a cafe. If you have a cafe and you have three seats in your cafe, um, you know, and, and you may need to serve uh, coffee for $15 a cup and, and turn those seats over pretty quickly, um, or it's going to be hard to make any money. And it's, um, in, you know, in farming sometimes it's similar. You're, you really are limited to the amount of trees. Um, and so if you produce a small volume of something, if that's going to actually equal any serious meaningful income at the end of the day, then price is going to have to be a lever. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
and oftentimes, you know, we see, I think one of the, the saving graces about this whole thing is that quality tends to align with different, find its way into certain productive models that require higher prices. Um, and so a lot of the places where we go where the producers are tiny, um, you know, the, the coffees are, are really dazzling. And there are other places, you know, where, where the coffees are, are consistent and great and there's a lot more volume, but, um, you know, the, the, the quality is also usually produced at, um, at a more standard though fine level um, with exceptional small lots that can be focused on and produced every once in a while. And I think that's directly related to the fact of how hand on uh, small farming really is. You know, it's, it's, it's hand baked and hand processed, um, hand sorted and everything, so. Okay, I have here another question from Jamie that asks, you mentioned you removed outliers. Would you say most of the producers included have other sources of income, income including intercropping? Yeah, it's a it's a really great um, it's a really great question from Jamie. We have um, a lot of the farmers uh, in in the diff in the regions where we looked. The majority of their income came from coffee. Certain areas it was ninety five percent plus. Um, other areas it was more like ninety percent. Um, there is some in, in intercrop income from intercropping. The most of the cases of the farmers that we looked at. And again, remember, these are people that are doing a pretty good job um, producing specialty coffee and are really hyper focused on that. Um, a lot of the intercropping was for their own consumption. Um, and now, while there were some families um, where the you know the on the uh, the adults that again were three on average um, that depended off the income from a farm did have temporary subsistence income. Um, from other activities, whether it's it's you know a temporary job in the city or it's seasonal work, sometimes even coffee picking in other area, um, we wanted to create a model that didn't look just at the reality of of what things actually cost, but what things should cost. And so the way we kind of went about it is, if we're all professionals making a living off of coffee, how can we also expect the producers to be just as passionate and just as dedicated as we are to coffee farming, but then to have to, into their calculations of price, add some subsistence income so that they can work kind of a part-time job that's in something else that's not necessarily coffee. And so we are trying to look at if people are going to be, be able to fully depend on just producing coffee as an economic activity um, without counting any subsistence income, what would they need? And similarly, again, we didn't look at the real cost even of picking. We looked at what the cost of picking should be if pickers were to also earn um, a minimum wage. And so that I, I hope that kind of answers answers the question. But that's sort of how we went about dealing with um, subsistence subsistence income. Um, and it's also why moving forward, mm -hmm. we're interested in looking at, at at living wage as as you know as as another one of the income goals. But it's also why we didn't use it in this first workshopping because we were unsure of how to deal with that accounting for um, alternative sources of income as we wanted to focus just on on income from coffee. Thank you for that, Tyler. I do want to continue, but I just want to ask you one more question that I see here and also ask you just to try to fit it in one sentence. What what is the what are the main drivers of the large differences uh, in the cost of production? And this question is by, posed by Stephanie Daniels. Um, one second, Vera, it cut out, and uh, I only got the no very worries. end of the question. The question was, um, what are the main drivers of the large of the large differences of cost of production? Okay, um, uh, another great question. Um, I think that the the largest um, cost of production. Uh, the, the I mean, the most important driver that we saw was picking. Um, without a doubt, and, and it makes up the lion's share of the cost of production, followed well, by fertilizing. I don't know if you remember the difference between the the slide with the organic producers and the non-organic producers, but the organic producers cost was down. I um, mean, that's largely because the second largest cost of production are, uh, after picking that we found were inputs. Um, mm -hmm. So I think picking would be number one, <clears throat> then it would be inputs. Um, Another thing that we looked at a lot was was yields. So people that were picking riper cherry um, were having better yields from cherries to parchment, um, which was something that was also involved. 
uh, in the cost of production, and though, but the the first two um, labor and uh, inputs were definitely the largest one that we found. But again, that's that's what's related to cost of production. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to, to price that needs to be paid, then it's um, then the variables uh, then it becomes multivariable, and you start to look at the the total um, acreage or, or hectares in this mm -hmm. case and the actual productivity as well. Thank you for that, Tyler. So, uh, so as we said, you know, and and also for the other ones, uh, or for other people posing questions, uh, what we will do, we also the ones that we are not able to still uh, answer, we will have a, a small uh, window of time at the end of this of, of the end of this lecture, and if not, we will definitely get back to you um, uh, by uh, answering your question uh, via mail. So regarding. Um, these income goals, the, at the end of the day, we also want to you know, link it back and see what are the implications when it comes to consumer prices. So um, a survey was also held uh, related to this. And um, Tyler, do you want to share a bit, start sharing a bit more about the survey that was held over the last week? Let me see. I think there is something with his connection going on. Um, kindly ask you for some patience here. Um, in the meantime, I can share a bit more, and also I'm, I'm here um, uh, with, with Ryan and, and with Jeff that they can still also, um, they were part of the process of this. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is that we actually basically wanted to head towards that piece of consumer prices. And the other piece was basically also involve um, roasters uh, and that we're able to feed us back on uh, what will happen actually with these income goals. Tyler, glad that you're back. Mm -hmm. I've just started that piece of the conversation as well. I put the slide already up of the survey participants, uh, if you mind taking over. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and so we, you know, we, we wanted to reach out to some companies that we thought were um, uh, interested in this that were familiar with FOB pricing um, and the sourcing of their companies um, and you know willing to provide information transparently and also kind of just get an idea of well if we're going to pay these prices to producers you know a question that we're receiving a lot of the time is what is the end you know cost to a consumer is this something that's out of you know out of the ballpark are we talking about paying twenty dollars for a cup of coffee here or you know what's what's the what's the real reality when it comes to this and so to kind of simplify things a little bit um we took the averages of the four areas one for the sake of this presentation so the averages between southern Wheela, southwestern Nourinho, um southern uh tolima planas and then the the high mountain municipalities in Quindío. and averaging out those four regions we got a price per carga that would need to be paid to achieve poverty line, minimum wage income, and a more sustainable income. And then what we started doing is just sort of layering different prices moving downstream in the chain on top of it. And so these are very just exemplary, or sorry, not exemplary, but illustrative prices um, of, of, uh, of what an FOB could look like. And so, you know, we, um, we used uh, some prices taking into account the average exchange rates for the last 12 months, um, assuming in this case a 10% gross margin to the exporter and approximate cost when it comes to uh, specialty prep, so strict milling, grain pro, et cetera, and came up with just some indicative prices um, to see kind of, okay, well, if, if you're paying that, you know, the, if that price to the farm for poverty line from the minimum wage or more sustainable income, what would you be looking at in terms of US dollars per pound of green coffee um, free on board a ship ready to leave a port um, in Colombia? And so you can see we got to 190, 245, um, and 375, uh, respectively. And, then, and these are actually the numbers that we shared um, without much context uh, and to, to some frustration with uh, the different survey participants. Um, nonetheless, they, they graciously answered and um, we, uh, we were able to, to average out um, sort of the, the international um, 
cost of uh, of some some retail prices. And so we were curious, you know, how would these convert into um, a 250 gram bag of whole bean coffee um, at the retail level, whether that's um, a cafe that the the respondents own, or whether it's um, a, ch a retail channel that they sell into the end price to consumer, say at a supermarket, um, and what would some of those prices um, look like at at 340 grams? Um, now we can come back to the slide once we um, uh, once Vera takes over and starts asking some more questions. But just quickly, what I want to do also is um, show everyone that we also did it for cups of coffee, and so we wanted to know, you know, based on a six ounce serving and a and a 12 ounce serving. Um, how would some of these different income goals, when applied to price, translate through to the end cost that a consumer could be expected um, to pay? And finally, you know, after looking at the the international averages, you can see on the very low end in a six ounce cup, we're looking at you know about 160 um, or 316 in a 12 ounce cup, all the way up to um, about four dollars and forty cents um, for the for more sustainable income price again that's um you know across several different regions um, and then we broke things out and we'll come we'll come back regionally so that you could look at the u.s averages um, as well as averages in local currency in canada averages in local currency in australia um and then the european averages but i'll, I'll come back to the international ones um while you kick it off there and you can take over with the slides uh, definitely. So um, I'm going to pause here. And um, so we have the international averages for, for the cups. And, and now currently the slide is on international averages for, for retail bags. Um, I wanted to, to, to again, you know, Jeff, Ryan, um, when you see these numbers, what are your first... Um, your first perspectives on these? Uh, let me start with Ryan there. Well, yeah, I think uh, when we first um, started putting this survey together, um, we weren't sure what we were going to see. Um, and also, we I think that's one of the concerns when you look at a more sustainable income is, are we going to see cups of coffee that are $15 a cup? And how sustainable is that on the other side? Um, but my first impression is just looking at this, um, it falls into a pretty um, a pretty common sector of what you'd typically see if you walk into, and I guess that's the survey too, but um, these are prices that um, seem pretty reasonable and something that you see pretty often when you walk into a specialty cafe um, also. Um, and I haven't been into a major chain cafe in a while, but it also doesn't seem too far off of that mark either. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and Jeff, how was it for you? <clears throat> you know, I I was also on you know, the idea of this, uh, expecting a slightly different result. I guess um, one of the things that is exciting to me in, in seeing this, and obviously, again, it's a small sample size, but. Um, the difference is when you start talking about uh, a pound of coffee or a cup of coffee between poverty line um, farmer prices or FOB prices and the more sustainable income become uh, extremely accessible. And I, I was looking through some of the, the questions in this chat uh, and I, a lot of them come from some of the same perspective, which is saying as, as roasters, retailers, uh, how can we work on achieving these uh, goals by um, incorporating our customers into these conversations. And I think it, it is critical that this not be simply an industry um, conversation or that the discussions around what does a more sustainable income mean, uh, that we find ways to translate these and connect them and link them to decisions we make about how coffee is sold. And I, you know, I put myself into the the shoes of a consumer sometimes, and I think you know one big question that everybody has is why does a coffee cost what it costs? Why does a pound cost what it costs? Why does a cup cost what it costs? You know, should it cost less? Should it cost more? Is it because the production costs were different? Is it because it's better in the cup? Is it because it's more marketable for some reason or another? 
mm-hmm. or some, you know, circumstance of history, uh, all of the above. And that to me is one of the places where this should um, logically lead us is to a, a place where the linkage between uh, the FOB price, the farm gate price uh, is a lot more clearly and cleanly tied to consumer pricing and where there is a, a mechanism uh, or a toolbox for consumers uh, to have conversations about why a coffee uh, costs what it costs that include both measures of quality and, and farmer income and that lead us all to make um, better decisions. Cause I do still uh, fall in that camp of optimists that believes uh, people will make good decisions if they have the right information. And one of the things Tyler, uh, when he first presented this work, it, he framed one of the first questions he asked was, what would you do if you knew? And it, that's a, a question that we can hold on to when thinking about how we make use of this work. Exactly. And I think it's just tying these uh, d- different or different or these pieces of the supply chain that is the the actual calculation and that's more transparent is needed for that. Um, it, it reminds me also, and I see also the question here posed by Aaron and 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 um, basically asking specifically that you know. So for him, he says, what can be the initial steps at a macro level? should we take as roasters and green buyers to be able to get to that sweet spot or that balance point where producers are being paid right by the coffee buyer, roasters being able to sell the coffee they bought to consumers at prices where they're able to sustain business and the consumers getting high quality coffee at the right price. I throw it to the floor, who would like to? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, when we go to, yeah, there's there's a lot, uh, there's a lot that needs to be explored and during our uh, conversations about it um, uh, leading up to this, um, we talked a lot about this as an all hands on deck. Um, it, it comes down to how we're communicating this and, you know, it takes uh, the finance team, it takes the marketing team, you know, it takes, I think, uh, roasters that um, understand, you know, the value of the, uh, the crop and the ingredients they're working with and, baristas that are eager and optimistic to um, uh, share these stories and um, talk about um, what is happening. Um, But I think um, in the end, when we look at the right price, um, we come back to, I think, the data that um, starts looking at what is it going to take that some of these producers don't decide, you know, their children that are growing up don't decide to start, um, you know, go into the city and work at a restaurant or start um, driving cabs. Um, and uh, I think it starts becoming more and more clear that, uh, you know, yeah, both parts of the chain need to be working in harmony together, but without coffee, um, we don't have anywhere to go. So, um, um, But no answer on the communication of. I think there's a lot of. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's an it's a definitely an industry um, uh, project. Thank you. Um, another one, and I think many people maybe were um, have this in mind. A question from Daniel. He says, um, "Do you actually pay that amount for coffee, and and if so, how do you grade the coffee to pay that amount?" Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a really good question. We are, um, we are, uh, admittedly sitting down and digesting these numbers ourselves. Um, in most cases we pay above the minimum wage, but not always the more sustainable income. Um, also there's been just with what's been happening internationally with the price of oil and the impact on exchange rates, it's making it kind of more possible than ever this year in Colombia to move more towards paying a more sustainable income and selling for, um, you know, a relatively um, uh, workable, I would call it FOB price. Um, but we're, we're trying to do kind of what Jeff hinted at earlier, which is what would you do if you know, um, and, and seeing, you know, even if this, Per, you know, um, 
doesn't allow us to work with certain customers because of, of price limitations, this is a practice that we want to adapt. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully this continues to answer your question and also addresses the earlier one that Aaron had a little bit as well. Um, we're, you know, we're also fully recognizing that this is a, a living in and breathing project and it's not something that's static. So we need to keep the data alive and we need to keep the re research going minimally on an annual basis. And so we're already working on a, one that looks at a larger data set in Colombia and that will look at um, information from 2019 uh, to inform the second semester harvest in Colombia of 2020. Um, and we're going to start working in Mexico as well. And so it's it's really just to understand um, to, to keep the to keep the data alive as this evolves. You may find yourself paying a, a more sustainable income derived price, say, to a producer for several years. And then likely, as we've seen happen, they may have purchased some more land, the, the reality may change, they may have some wiggle room as they start to sell more volume. And that can even happen in, in, in certain regions where producers are starting um, to thrive. And so we want to try to keep this uh, as alive as possible. And, and um, you know, I think as Ryan was hinting on a little bit too, use it as a tool for the inside of the industry, for peers, like, a lot of the people that are in, at, you know, in this lecture right now or in this, on this, uh, attending the panel, is able to, to talk about how can we use this, whether we're sitting down with our CFO or sitting down with, um, you know, who, whoever it is, talk about, you know, hey, this thing exists. There's a new sort of benchmark and it takes into account income in a more systematic way. And, you know, this is involved in, in, in sort of the, the decisions I'm, I'm making around pricing this year. Um, and then at the same time, how can we sit together and think of creative ways um, to get the message to the consumer so that the consumer knows, you know, there's not another certification floating around out there trying to replace one that came before it, but there is a, call it a movement or call it a methodology or call it whatever, a way to go about um, purchasing coffee that systematically takes into account something we're all concerned about, which is um, the income of producers. Thanks, Tyler, for that. We have two minutes yet on the clock, and I'm just Briefly, please, uh, uh, guys, uh, thank you all for, for being on, on, on this webinar. I'm skimming to the question and try to, to f fit it in here. And before, I, I, I also ask the, the panelists to, to maybe give one of the, the outtakes of, of what we have seen so far. A briefly, quick question that somebody is asking, which is a good one as well, um, from Mr. Rick. What framework was used for calculating the price per cup in these calculations? Tyler. Um, the the framework was was pretty. I mean, we depended depended a lot on the respondents to answer, and we gave them an FOB price, and we said, um, you know, based on this FOB price, what would you um, have to charge uh, for a cup of filter coffee um, in your own establishment, or if you only do wholesale, what would one of your wholesale customers likely charge for a cup of filter coffee and what are the milliliters or ounces making up that cup of filter coffee. And so, you know, one of the things that we're aware about is that the pricing on the six ounces, for example, in the US is probably a bit low because people, some people aren't selling six ounce cups of coffee. Um, we, we saw a lot more of that in Europe, um, for example, and some in Australia, um, whereas maybe the ones that are 12 ounces. <coughs> so we really did say, what's the, the, the size that you're seeing on average and what is the price that you're charging um, it's something that we you know this was really just an initial stab we literally did the survey um over the weekend um but you know it's something that we, we'd like to do a lot more to really sort of just be able to answer that question that some people are having which is okay but at, likely at the end of the day what is this going to cost i noticed one of the other questions that people asked was you know did did you did you add, did you use different markups to make these more sustainable, or did the industry maintain their markups? We didn't ask anyone to change anything. We just said, "What would you charge if you'd gone out and paid this price?" Um, FOB. Mm -hmm. I hope that kind of answers it. Thank you, Tyler. Um, it's um, exactly here in Mexico City, seven seven p.m. Um, so I just want to just. Uh, take the opportunity before Julie comes and kicks us out of this platform. Jeff, um, Ryan, some final words of wisdom. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I think one of the, the missing links in all of this, uh, as people are asking questions, and I see a lot of them have to do with uh, how, does, how do we make use of this information? Uh, where does it, how does it change behavior? Uh, not just in specialty, but in 
the commercial sector of coffee as well. And, you know, like G.I. Joe always said, uh, knowing is half the battle, getting this information in front of people so that they can begin to use it to think differently about the valuation of coffee is, is I, I think, one of the major goals. And uh, the concept of transparency is critical to all of this having um, not just meaning, but impact, because until we can slight move some of the conversations around coffee value into a space where it considers uh, the prices that trickle throughout the whole supply chain, it'll always be hard for us to make gain a lot of ground in terms of um, compelling or persuading consumers to uh, pay more attention to where they're getting their coffee. Thank you for that. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, to piggyback a little bit on what uh, Jeff just said, um, I'm looking forward to just uh, the tool that this creates and um, mm -hmm. already the conversations that uh, this pilot has um, uh, started um, bringing up just the questions that we're able to ask and seeing how uh, um, we can just keep going down this road and um, uh, continuing to learn more knowledge about uh, about these costs and uh, these tools and um, being able to utilize them to uh, make more insightful um, decisions on how we go about how we're purchasing our coffee um, and how we're sharing it, so. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, Tyler, one sentence, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I hope to be in touch with everyone and, and answer your questions. Uh, I really appreciate them. I'm amazed at how many are coming in still. Thank you so much for that. So for everybody, um, feel free. Uh, I will work with the SCA to get these questions over to the following email address, which is, appears on the, on the screen. In the meantime, thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you so much, Ryan, Jeff, for the last week's working with us uh, on this. And uh, everybody stay safe. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.